Incoming transmission. Welcome. 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 Welcome to True Spies. Week by week, mission by mission, you'll hear the true stories behind the world's greatest espionage operations. You'll meet the people who navigate this secret world. What do they know? What are their skills? And what would you do in their position? I'm Vanessa Kirby, and this is True Spies, Russia's Laundromat. Part three, Putin's butler. In the past two episodes of True Spies, you've heard from Russian investigators getting to the heart of the West's dirty money problem. Stolen fortunes, typically funneled through intricate networks of banks, accountants and lawyers, sheltered in offshore accounts and businesses. Very often used to purchase lavish real estate in some of the most expensive cities in the world. But on occasion, stolen money is used to buy some unconventional things. And when news broke that a wealthy Ukrainian had purchased a London tube station, that's when this week's true spy set to work. It's not just a little pokey tube station, it's a real sizable property. This tube station, it, it used to be a Ministry of Defence office and it has a big, a big, what would have been a garage for military vehicles. And that's, to my mind, the most clear-cut demonstration of how in Britain basically everything is for sale. You know, membership of the establishment is for sale. You know, medals are for sale. You know, tube stations are for sale. Um, it, it's pretty remarkable. This is a story about all that money can buy. It's about more than greed, more than nepotism, more than secrecy. It's a story about signing a check for the right to control history and how the West offers its pen. There was hope in the early 90s that the countries of the former Soviet Union could have been different. They could have developed in a different direction and become free and prosperous, and they didn't. So a lot of the work I do is essentially to try and work out who's to blame for that. You know, why did that promise get betrayed? My name is Oliver Bullo. I'm a journalist and an author, and I'm from the UK. Unlike Roman Borisovich and Alessia Shmagun, Oliver Bullo is not a native to Russia. He moved there in 1999, just in time to see Putin assume the office of the presidency for the first time. But Russia has held Oliver's attention since he was a boy. I think it's a combination of things that always attracted me to Eastern Europe. Partly, I think that just during my formative years as a sort of child at school and then going on up into my time at university, Eastern Europe were just was where history was happening. The Berlin Wall came down when I was, what, 11 or 12, maybe. And then, you know, the Soviet Union collapsed and it was just, it felt like the most exciting place to be where history was being unlocked. And also, I think, quite seriously... I was very influenced by Tintin. Yes, you heard right. Tintin. The fearless reporter at the centre of the Belgian comic book series. He was always going to these sort of fictional Eastern European countries, Borduria and Soldavia, and having these wacky, wonderful adventures. And it just seemed so much fun. I grew up on a farm in mid Wales, which was lovely, but quite quiet by the standards of what seemed to be happening in Eastern Europe. I just wanted a bit of that. In my life. Of course, the real life work of a journalist in Eastern Europe, particularly today, can be a little less cheerful than the cartoons make it look, particularly when you're a journalist focused on corruption. Oliver says that for a long time, he didn't realise just how deeply the problem was embedded in the countries he was interested in. I was an idiot, and uh, a lot of people are when they're young, but I was a particularly good idiot. I was embarrassingly late to realising the true nature of corruption in the former Soviet Union. I mean, in my defence, I think a lot of people didn't realise. There was very few people who were talking about it. You know, there is this persistent idea of corruption that you get, particularly in Transparency International's work, that it's something which you can judge a country by how corrupt it is. You know, they have a map, the Corruption's Perception Index, where each country has a different colour showing how corrupt it is. And I think that's how a lot of people think of corruption. As Roman and Alessia have said, 
What people think of as Eastern European corruption doesn't remain within national borders. It was really only after 2014 when the revolution in Ukraine happened and I started systematically looking at corruption and how it worked. And, I mean, to be fair, it was easier then because obviously the government had fallen so there was a lot more information around. But I started looking at how corruption worked and I realised that that idea that Ukrainian corruption is a Ukrainian phenomenon or Russian corruption is a Russian phenomenon, it's just totally false. You cannot understand it that way because the money doesn't stay within any one country and in order to understand how corruption and mismanagement works and so essentially in order to try and understand who's to blame for the fact that these countries have not developed sort of prosperously and democratically. You need to look at more than one country and you need to look at people in multiple roles and multiple jurisdictions. So that's what I started doing. Oliver has built a career reporting on financial crime, oligarchy and thievery. And over years of investigating Eastern European corruption, a pattern began to emerge, implicating one country in particular. Again and again and again, the UK featured it wasn't the only place where the money ended up. It wasn't the only place that moved the money. It wasn't the only place that provided the lawyers that helped hide the money. But it was always there in a way that no other country was. Oliver's latest book encapsulates us neatly in one evocative metaphor. Britain, he says, is the butler to people like Boris, the fictional character in part one of this series, or to Sergei Roldugan, the very real concert cellist featured in part two. Whatever a kleptocrat needs, Oliver says, the UK is happy to serve it on a silver platter. That is under-recognised in the UK, it's under-discussed, it's under-recognised anywhere. If these countries are going to have any chance of breaking free of this sort of predatory political elite who've colonised them, then at the very least, foreigners need to start helping the good guys instead of helping the bad guys. And in order to do that, we need to make sure we try and knock the UK out of the business. I mean, let's face it, <laughs> it's not going to happen. But, you know, maybe it could happen a tiny bit. But you might be wondering, what about that tube station? The story of how an oligarch came to acquire a London underground station begins with a surprisingly optimistic moment in history. In 2004 and 2005, during the Orange Revolution, Kremlin-backed Viktor Yanukovych had won Ukraine's presidential election. But the results were widely believed to have been manipulated. When the country's Supreme Court ordered another round of voting, the votes were counted fairly, and Yanukovych's opponent, Viktor Yushchenko, was declared the clear winner. It was a triumph of democracy for a country that had struggled to get on its feet since the fall of the Soviet Union. I was there in the streets sort of partying with the Ukrainians who were standing up to this rigged election. It was really, you know, a fabulously sort of hopeful advance of democracy in, in a general picture across the former Soviet Union, which was the opposite. As Putin's preferred candidate for Ukraine, Yanukovych had represented Russian interference in Ukrainian political life something that the majority of Ukrainians wanted to break away from. The Orange Revolution sent a message to Russia, hands off Ukraine. But the victory was short-lived. Putin's government did not appreciate being put in its place. The promise of that revolution was very much snuffed out by the gas trade. The gas trade was always Russia's lead that they could tug on to make the Ukrainians fall back in line. And they would doubled the gas price at the end of 2005. And the Ukrainians had tried to refuse to pay and, and the gas had been cut off and they'd been forced to back down and it had destroyed the Orange Coalition. And it really felt like the gas trade had become this geopolitical tool being used by Putin. Ukraine was in a vulnerable position. When the Soviet Union fell, it had been left in dire financial straits. The Ukrainian economy, obviously, having been part of the Soviet economy, is very tightly integrated with the gas system that comes out of Russia and Turkmenistan. All the heavy industry and, and domestic heating and everything is powered by gas. So when Ukraine became independent in 1991, it didn't really have any gas of its own, or very little. So it became highly dependent on imports of gas from Russia and Central Asia. And they became control of those imports, control of the pipelines through which gas flows into and through Ukraine became the main prize of Ukrainian politics. It was a big corrupting factor. 
Russia made money from exporting gas through pipelines, which went through Ukraine en route to Europe. And Ukraine realized it could turn a bit of extra profit by stealing some of that gas along the way. Russia couldn't cut the country off, because then it would be cutting its own ties to its customers in the West. When Vladimir Putin took office as Russia's president in 2000, he claimed he was determined to crack down on the thievery. But not because he wanted to end the corruption entirely. When Putin became president, he transformed that from just being straightforwardly corrupting in a, in a financial sense to being a tool of political control and a way of trying to dominate Ukrainian politics to sort of recreate Russian influence over Ukraine. Putin wanted to install a system that would serve his interests within Ukraine, Oliver says that would allow him to profit from the money being siphoned out of the pipelines. And it would also give him the power to manipulate Ukraine's political leadership, which had become accustomed to the money they stole from the gas trade. And obviously he needed a local partner to do that. And that's when we had these intermediary companies being used to trade gas with Ukraine. One such intermediary company was installed between Russia and Ukraine in 2004, a company known as RUE. It was half owned by Gazprom, and the other owner, well, no one could say for sure exactly who that was. Today, we know exactly who it was. That intermediary was Dmitry Firtash. Dmitry Firtash, a 39-year-old Ukrainian businessman whose name almost nobody knew. I first read about Mr. Firtash in, it would have been 2006, when... Global Witness, the campaigning organization, wrote a report about him, or rather they wrote a report about the gas trade between Ukraine, Russia and Turkmenistan, attempting to get to the bottom of who was behind all these intermediary companies that kind of dominated the trade. Dmitry Firtash was born in Western Ukraine in 1965 and came of age just as the Soviet Union was collapsing. Apparently, he found a way to take advantage of the tenuous political and economic situation in his native country. He's initially an unknown individual, but he sort of outed himself shortly after that Global Witness report was published that I mentioned. He outed himself in a series of interviews with the international press, with the, the Wall Street Journal and um, the FT, because essentially the pressure around this gas contract had become so intense. Global Witness had questioned why, exactly, it was so unclear who owned RUE. After all, someone who controls the supply of gas between Russia and Ukraine is a powerful person indeed. So, who was Dmitry Firtash exactly? Global Witness didn't even have a photograph for him. They used an image with a question mark in its place. But even with all the sketchy details, one could safely assume he was very, very rich. It was later reported that he resold gas that Gazprom sold to him at an artificially low price, allowing him to pocket $3 billion. Plus, he had billions more in bank loans and had businesses across various sectors in the Ukrainian economy, all of which belonged to a company called Group DF, based in the British Virgin Islands. What could he possibly do with all of that wealth? He needed somewhere to spend it, and that's when he decided to essentially build a second home in the UK. Right, this old song and dance. But this isn't your run-of-the-mill Russian oligarch buys fancy flat story. For one thing, Firtash is Ukrainian. And as Oliver said, dirty money doesn't stay within clearly defined borders. In this case, the line between Firtash's interests and Ukraine's and Russia's would become dangerously blurred. You know, if you think about what he had done, he had made a huge fortune for himself, but he had also partnered with Russia, with Putin, who by this stage it was clear was no friend of democracy, to essentially bring a democratically elected pro-Western government into line in Ukraine. That's where his profit was. So what he was doing was very much against, you know, what you might term Western interests, and very much in the Kremlin's interests. So here's a wealthy Ukrainian businessman working in the interests of the Kremlin, ready to sink his fortune into the United Kingdom. The UK, being the butler that it is, laid out the welcome mat. 
He had allies in the UK. There was a couple of lobbyists, one of them a Ukrainian who'd relocated to the UK after the Orange Revolution. Another one was a member of the House of Lords, a former spy, actually, called um, Lord Asquith. And the two of them had built up a lobbying organisation, a fairly niche boutique lobbying organisation. And he essentially arrived and followed a pathway that is open to very wealthy foreigners who come to the UK, whereby they can essentially follow a series of steps that allow them to integrate into British society. On the off chance that you're an oligarch hoping to get established in England, worry not. It's not a lengthy pathway. Or, at least, it wasn't until recently. Fiatash was able to ingratiate himself in British society with just two simple steps. Step one, establish a foundation. He created a society, the British Ukrainian Society, to sort of increase mutual understanding and friendship and all the kind of yada yada stuff which you know, these kind of societies do. But really what it allowed him to do was to rub shoulders with members, particularly of the House of Lords and the House of Commons, to essentially create a network of friends in high places. Step two, give money to well-respected institutions. Cambridge University didn't have a Ukrainian studies department and he provided the money to allow it to create one. It wasn't that much money considering how rich he was. It's about a total of five million pounds, which I think is about, what, six or seven million dollars. But he created this department and was, you know, obviously the university was very grateful as it's very grateful to anyone who gives it substantial amounts of money. And so he was welcomed onto its guild of benefactors by none other than the Duke of Edinburgh, the Queen's husband. There's a photo from that event showing Fiatash decked out in the crimson gown of the guild of benefactors. Prince Philip looks him straight in the eye with an expression of gratitude. Fiatash, for his part, looks positively gleeful. So within four years of arriving in the country, he'd built this network of, you know, friends in the House of Lords and the House of Commons. And he'd also got integrated to one of the country's most prestigious universities to such an extent that he'd been given a medal by the Queen's husband. Remember, this is a guy who was the subject of an international report just five years prior. Global Witness had called for Ukraine to investigate Fiatash and his company, to see how they gained access to the Ukrainian gas market, and to find out if they were really working in the best interests of the country. But Kiev is a long way from London. He had risen so far and so fast. He bought himself a mansion in West London, just um, across the road from Harrods, the big shop. It's luxurious, newly built. It's not entirely clear how much he paid for it, but a one property publication estimated it paid £60 million, pounds, and I've never seen anything to suggest that that's not the case. And then his integration continued. He opened trading on the London Stock Exchange. He uh, created a, a festival called Days of Ukraine, including various events inside the House of Commons. He met the Speaker of the House of Commons, which is you know, one of the most sort of significant political figures in the UK. And then, in late 2013, tension began to mount in Ukraine. The Euromaidan protests had led to a lot of bloodshed, and then the president fled, and uh, Russia sent troops into annex Crimea, and later into the east of the country. Britain, being a global superpower, would need to act strategically. And you'll never guess who its leadership looked to for help. Dmitry Firtash was invited into the British Foreign Office, you know, it's for the foreign ministry here in the UK, to give advice to how to how to deal with Putin. And his advice apparently was, you know, that this was all the Americans' fault and, and that, you know, Putin should be treated very gently. So that's kind of astonishing as well. You know, he'd gone from being, you know, an unknown business ally of Gazprom, Putin's gas company, to advising a G7 member on how to deal with Putin. Isn't it amazing what money can buy? In case you were thinking Fiatash had traded in his Ukrainian influence to move amongst the British establishment, he had done no such thing. He still retained an outsized amount of power in his own country. He owns a bank, he owns a TV station, um, he has other business interests. He funded Yanukovych's... I mean, Yanukovych had, had lost the Orange Revolution. He was the man who lost the Orange Revolution. He then comes back in 2010, is elected president. Fiatash helps to, to fund his campaign. He doesn't sort of relocate lock, stock and barrel to the UK. He just uses it as a kind of second home, as a, you know, a place where he can enjoy his wealth. So yeah, he's very much living these two lives at the time um, in a way that is 
kind of extraordinary to look at now that, that no one in the UK really was troubled by this. Here's a man who's gobbled up power and property in two different countries, who's given Western authorities every reason to be suspicious of where his money came from and what he's doing with it abroad. And he's advising a NATO country on how to deal with the Russian invasion in Ukraine. He'd bought the trust and attention of the British establishment. And yet, Oliver says, that wasn't even his most notable purchase. The real culmination of his sort of UK integration strategy came just a a couple of days later when he closed the deal to buy a tube station from the British government. As far as I know, he's the only private individual to own a tube station. It's a disused tube station, but it's still got the platforms and the shafts and the, and the, you know, the ticket hall. It still looks like a tube station. So, you know, he bought that from the Ministry of Defence, who wanted rid of it for £53 million. Pounds. Let's recap Dimitri Fiatash's purchases to date. He's got a foundation, the British Ukrainian Society, ostensibly fostering ties between the UK and Ukraine. He's got a Ukrainian studies department at Cambridge, one of the most revered universities in the world. He's got a £60 million mansion in West London. No big deal. He's got British parliamentarians lapping up his dangerous political advice. And he's got the disused Brompton Road tube station, which he bought from the government itself. Fair to say that Fiatash was, by that point, fully integrated. And if you're asking... Why would anyone need a tube station? Fair enough. It is a bit of a head-scratcher. And that's precisely why our modern Tintin jumped on the story. My approach to investigations that I do or stories I want to write is that there is a huge quantity of corruption out there, far more corruption than I can possibly investigate, and that the vast majority of it is in the form of stories that are so complicated it's going to be impossible to interest an editor in them. So I always need to have a detail, you know, a a kind of funny snippet that will catch the reader's attention and make it a story that nominally isn't about corruption, but it's actually nominally about something else. So the fact that he'd bought a tube station just makes him jump out from among oligarchs, right? He's not just any oligarch, he's the oligarch who bought the tube station. In light of the changing climate in Ukraine, a man like Fiatash deserved careful scrutiny. Once Fiatash purchased the tube station, Oliver seized the opportunity to investigate. And then, you know, it was a question, I suppose, also of after the revolution in Ukraine, just tracking down who owned what. You know, there was a sudden discussion about confiscating assets and returning them to the Ukrainian government, and it just became interesting to look into what was around. But what does looking into it really mean? I mean, it's embarrassingly simple, to be honest. I mean, you know, a lot of oligarchs hide their assets behind layers and layers and layers of trusts and foundations and partnerships and companies and all the sort of various offshore paraphernalia. You'll remember that from episode two of this series with Panama Papers investigator Alessia Schmagoon. In order to find Mr. Firtash's mansion, which as far as I know, I was the first person to realise was his. I mean, literally all I did was type his name into the phone book, 192.com, which is a you know, phone book here in the UK. And I didn't find him, but I did find Lada Fiatash, his, his wife. So I was like, oh, well, there you go. He's just got the house in her name. I mean, I knew he had a place somewhere in London. I just didn't know where it was. Sometimes investigative journalism is all about asking simple questions and making the most of simple answers. At the time, I was living in London, and so I just took the tube across town you know, this all makes investigative journalism very easy. And I walked to the address and had a look, and and it was a basement flat on Brompton Square, you know, really quite pokey and dark, and it seemed improbable that this could possibly be the London residence of one of the wealthiest oligarchs in Ukraine. The address of this flat was certainly posh, just a stone's throw from Harrods, the Victoria and Albert Museum, and Hyde Park. But the home itself seemed, to Oliver, remarkably unassuming. But this was a basement flat. You went down a sort of metal rung series of stairs and there was a door and a couple of windows very much overshadowed by the street. I mean, you know, they wouldn't get any sunlight except, you know, on a, on a very unusual cloudless summer's day. So it seemed weird that an oligarch would live there. And it struck me that maybe there was a different Lada Firtash, you know, maybe there were two of them. What would you do in Oliver's shoes? Call her today. 
cut your losses and go home? Well, you wouldn't be much of an investigative journalist then. Besides, you've already made the trip. Having gone all that way, I mean, I'd literally spent 25 minutes on the tube. I was damned if it was going to be a wasted journey. I thought, well, maybe he's got some stuff hidden behind a, a shell company around here too. And so I thought, well, I'll just wander around and see if there's anything that looks more likely to be an oligarch's house. So Oliver poked around the neighbourhood. Nothing. Houses worth maybe two or three million pounds, but nothing fit for a Ukrainian gas magnet. And then I walked back onto the Brompton Road and round the corner, past the old tube station. I mean, you can tell it's a tube station because it's got that kind of burgundy glazed tile that tube stations have on the outside. And then, just down the road, there it was. There was this huge white brick, very modern, very stark mansion, which had clearly been built in the last three or four years. It had two giant bronze elephant sculptures outside the front door and it had some multiple balconies running up. It's a real piece of work. And you're like, oh, okay, that's an oligarch's house. Uh, as it turned out, as I later looked it up on the planning deeds on the local authority website, you could only see half of it. It goes down into the ground as much as it goes up. It's got two basements, a swimming pool in the second basement. And I was like, oh, I see, now you're talking. This is an oligarch's property. But if this was Fiatasha's real home, what was that other flat Oliver had seen earlier? You can stand up on a railing and kind of peer over the neighbouring garage, which is next to it, and see to the back of the other side of the street. So actually, I was seeing to the back of the house that held that basement flat that was registered in Lada Fiatash's name. And then I could see that the back of that house was done in the same coloured bricks, very unusual white brick you don't see in London. So it was clear that actually that basement flat that had first alerted me to the presence of the Fiatashes was essentially a back door out of this, that they'd built a, a house that punched all the way through the block. And then it was right next door to the tube station. Suddenly, like, oh, that's why he wanted to buy the tube station, because, you know, the tube station is adjoining to his house. It was the embodiment of unthinkable wealth. Unthinkable because of its magnitude. The sheer scope of Fiatashes' buying power is hard to fathom and unthinkable because who was paying any mind? Britain had willingly traded real estate and influence for vast quantities of questionable cash without considering the consequences, without thinking through exactly whom they were enabling. As a result, Putin's Ukrainian point man in Britain was left unchecked. Even in 2014, after Russia had crossed into Ukrainian territory, a harbinger of a greater crisis to come. This issue of people of questionable political ties um, and questionable fortunes coming to the UK and using that money to buy access and friends, you know, was a live issue that people were debating. But it seems to be a thing that's only debated after the fact, you know, after the particular regime has collapsed. It's only then that people get worried about it. No one ever seems to be worried about it proactively. And then the issue was, of course, that in 2014, uh, the Americans unsealed an arrest warrant for Dmitry Firtash. The 12th of March, 2014, Vienna, Austria. Authorities arrested Dmitry Firtash on charges resulting from an FBI investigation in the state of Illinois relating to international corruption conspiracy. They had indicted him before a grand jury on charges of corruption related to the titanium trade in India. And because of Boeing was at the time headquartered in, in Chicago, the Illinois FBI had been investigating. Fiatash was held in custody until he posted a bond of 125 million euros, a price he could afford to pay. It was at this point Oliver realized why Fiatash outed himself back in 2006. It wasn't because he was being investigated by the British campaigning organization, Global Witness, but because he was being investigated by the American Domestic Intelligence Service. And the American press had caught wind of it. American investigators were very concerned about the gas deal, were very concerned about his business ties. Uh, he has consistently had to deny connections to a notorious Russian mobster called Simeon Magalievich, who is wanted by the FBI. Simeon Mogilevich is not the very worst of the Russian mob bosses, but he is the most wanted. He was living in Hungary, a country that was willing to cooperate with the US in hunting him down. 
local officials turned over thousands of pages of documents, implicating him in money laundering crimes. US investigators were now apprised of his links to Russia's suspicious gas shipments to Ukraine. And that, of course, linked him to Fiatash. There does appear to have been some acquaintanceship between Mr. Fiatash and Mr. Mogilevich back in the 1990s or early 2000s. And he's had to consistently deny ever having been in business with him. I think probably why he outed himself was to try and bring a bit of daylight into his business dealings because these rumors about Mogilevich were beginning to look worrying to his business ambitions. So that's actually why he exposed himself to the FT and the Wall Street Journal and so on. Fiatash has denied having any business dealings with the mobster. Still, after years of investigation, the Americans had gathered enough evidence to make an arrest, which Austrian police officers carried out on their behalf. Fiatash posted the 125 million euro bail but that wasn't the end of the story. We don't yet know the end of the story. The Ukrainian businessman has lived under house arrest in Austria for eight years now, fighting extradition to the US. Meanwhile, back in the UK, Oliver Bullough has been making the most of Fiatash's wealth ever since he found his London mansion. What happened next really is that I was then talking to my friend Roman Borisovich, you've been talking to as well. Roman Borisovich, the anti-corruption campaigner you met in part one of this series. And Roman had put together this idea for the kleptocracy tours. I think him and a, a friend came up with it. And they wanted residences to highlight. Roman and his campaigning group, Clamp K, were organizing tours around London so that sightseers could ogle at the homes of oligarchs and thieves. And who better to partner with than one of the UK's best known investigators of corruption? So I said to Roman, let's do the tube station. He was like, oh yeah, brilliant. So um, in his very enthusiastic Romanish way. That's how Oliver and Roman began taking groups of people to Fiatash's private home, to take in its scale from the outside and to hear the truth about the kleptocrat who owns it. And it was just brilliant because every time we turned up, whoever was in the house, and it wasn't Fiatash because he was in Vienna, but whether it was his wife or his butler or whatever, I don't know, whoever was in the house would call the police. And the police would turn up and tell us to move on and then we'd point out that we were in a public place and a perfect right to do what we liked. And, and, it, and we'd have a bit of back and forth. And so they kept coming up with new reasons to call the police because obviously the police got quite wise to the fact that, you know, we were just fairly harmless people and not doing any harm. And eventually got to the point when they'd just say, look, here's a phone number. If you're going to do this, can you just give us a call so we know to ignore it? It's a great bit of fun. But don't forget the grim reality beneath it. Because for all the work Roman does to clamp down on kleptocracy, and for all the books and articles Oliver writes to call attention to the problem, there's no undoing the damage Fiatash has done, or what he represents. He still hasn't been convicted of any crimes, and so they haven't convicted him of a crime, and maybe he never will be. But his role in the development of Ukraine has been objectively to help Vladimir Putin over the years to maintain his influence over Ukraine and to stymie political forces trying to help the country develop in a different direction. You know, that's undeniable. The time when history could be written in service of peace and prosperity in post-Soviet Europe has passed, Oliver says. Things could have gone differently for Ukraine in 2022, just as they could have gone differently back in the 90s. Things are changing in the UK. They're changing in America. And as Alessia says, it all comes a day late and many billions of dollars short. This corrupted money not only undermines European-owned democracy, but from Russian point of view, of course, it looks like hypocrisy because they always talking about corrupt Russian politicians. But with the other hand, they, you know, they actually enabling this corruption to happen. And only now then something that terrible happened, they started to really like try to stop this. So finally, European democracy started to do what we were talking about like many years, but it seems it's a little bit too late. For his part, Roman Borisovich sees hope on the horizon. 
Hopefully the time is coming, and, and I think it's uh, coming now, when this information is finally going to be uh, useful. My colleagues, especially my colleagues at the uh, Russian Anti-Corruption Foundation, they were trying for for the last decade to bring uh, out the corruption cases out of Russia. And uh, I feel that only recently then that that has uh, started happening, and that you know the, the information that they're contributing is being taken seriously. And after the 24th of February, Obviously, the situation has changed completely, and I think that there is a genuine interest now. Western countries are waking up to their own role in this war. But if things continue as they are, Oliver says, we'll only get more of the same. One point that I think the Dmitry Firtash episode illustrates very clearly is that since Putin invaded Ukraine, there has been a huge amount of attention on Russian oligarchs in particular. And I always try and say, well, it's not just Russian oligarchs, it's oligarchs from all places. Actually, the people are the same. The way they obtain their money is the same. And so I suppose what I keep trying to warn people about is the fact that it's totally conceivable that if China invaded Taiwan, that you'd end up in an identical situation with Chinese oligarchs. You suddenly go, oh, wow, we should never have let their money in in the first place. You wait for a foreign policy crisis. You wait for Libya to be in turmoil, and then you decide you shouldn't have accepted money from Gaddafi's son. Or you wait for Ukraine to be in turmoil and decide you shouldn't have accepted money from Dmitry Firtash. We're complicit in the fact that they're stealing so much money and therefore we're complicit in the immiseration of the lives of millions upon millions, of tens of millions, hundreds of millions of people. And we should get out of that game now. You can learn more about Britain's role in international corruption and money laundering in Oliver's book, Butler to the World. I'm Vanessa Kirby. Join us next time as we meet a ragtag group of civilian spies who uncovered the horrific secrets of the Third Reich. <laughs>